In this module, we will go over positive attitudes and behaviors. In this module, positive attitudes and behaviors, we will go over the following. Directions, self-awareness at work, building character in the workplace, working as a team member, understanding group dynamics, conflict resolution skills, understanding ethics, effective communication skills, active listening skills, six ways of using nonverbal communication skills effectively, differences in the workplace, being assertive, not aggressive, characteristics of positive work relationships. Directions, their importance. The importance of instruction is so you will know what to do and how to do it right. For example, you need to know how to follow instructions at school so you will get a good grade. There can be a lot of penalties for not following instructions. For example, if you don't follow instructions with medicine, you could get sick. Instructions and directions. It's not always fun having to follow instructions and directions, but they are important because they help things to turn out better. They also help to keep us safe, and they help us to make and do some really cool things. Look directly at the speaker and listen closely. Show that you understand. For example, nod your head. Picture each step in your mind. Repeat the directions to yourself or the speaker. Ask the speaker to explain anything you do not understand. Reply to emails acknowledging any directions or instructions. What's wrong, Melinda? I had a bad day at work, Bill. My boss said I have a bad attitude and need to develop good workplace behaviors, but I don't know where to start. Well, it's something you can learn. The first step is following directions. Why is it important to follow directions? Directions are important because you need to know what to do and how to do it right. It may not always be fun, but it helps keep us safe in the workplace and yields better results. Sometimes I like to just start doing something the way I want to do it because it's easier. Is that what you're talking about? That's a good point. Directions are there for a reason. It may seem easier from your point of view, but in the long term, doing something your own way instead of following directions may mean that the work has to be completely redone, getting you in trouble. I guess I can work on that, but how do I show my boss I'm really trying? Here are a few things you can practice. First, look directly at the speaker and listen closely. Second, show that you understand by nodding your head, for example. Three, visualize or picture each step of the direction in your mind. Four, repeat the directions to yourself. Five, and make sure you ask if any part of the directions are unclear. Reasonable accommodations. The ability to understand or comprehend written and or verbal instruction is a necessary requirement in most workplaces across all industries. Those with a cognitive impairment, such as a specific learning disability or intellectual disability, often experience some degree of difficulty with language in general, and as a result, typically do not process strong language and communication skills. Consequently, they may need extra support and consideration or alternative means of instruction. For example, they may learn more effectively by seeing and doing, using a hands-on approach, or through active learning strategies. If you are having challenges, Related to your disability, following or acknowledging direction, please reach out to the staff member or professional assigned to your case. Self-awareness at work. Please click on the dividers provided for you on the right-hand side to learn more about self-awareness at work. Importance of self-awareness. The importance of self-awareness cannot be underestimated. Self-awareness is an absolute must for anybody wanting to know how to be more productive at work. In learning how to be more productive at work, we need to recognize the importance of self-awareness. We need to know what we are doing, how we are doing it, and where we are wasting time and so on. It's only by being truly self-aware that we can ever really hope to be more successful. After all, you can't get from A to B if you don't know where A is. No self-awareness. Many people are not self-aware all the time. Maybe it is someone at the gym who thinks that all the equipment is his or her very own and doesn't like to share. Or maybe it is a family member who believes that they are always right and that the rest of the world is always wrong. 
Or maybe you work with a colleague who just doesn't have any sense of how they are bullying others. Some of these people can produce continual toxicity in our lives, while others may cause only a monetary frustration. Whoever or whatever the case may be, these people are among us. Why is self-awareness? But why is self-awareness so important? It makes us better people. Here's why. Empathy. Having the ability to see when we are wrong or when we have made a mistake allows us to see other people's perspectives and to be empathetic to their situations or their feelings. Admission. Have you noticed when people aren't self-aware, it is very difficult for them to apologize or admit that they are wrong. Often these people can't even see that they are wrong in the first place. They tend to think that they are always right, and if something doesn't work out as planned, it is always someone else's fault. Man in the mirror. If we can acknowledge our flaws, we can make positive changes to improve upon them. Knowing is half the battle, and if you can admit to the qualities that are less than stellar about yourself, you can change them or improve upon them. Tolerance. When you can see your own faults, it is easier to accept others. Humility. Understanding that we ourselves are not perfect allows us to get off our high horses. Further, now we can always be better and as a result can be thankful for the good that does come our way. Likeable. Let's face it, no one likes a know-it-all or an individual who thinks that they are always right. Having the ability to see other people's viewpoints, to be open and flexible, and acknowledge that you are not the only person who has the answer makes you a more attractive person. Click on the dividers provided above to go over some questions and answers related to self-awareness. How self-aware are you? Here are a few questions to ask. Do I react with my gut or respond with my head when faced with emotional triggers at work? Reacting with your gut is reacting when you are at an emotional peak. Try to take the time needed to regain emotional composure so that you can respond from your head. For example, allow time for the adrenaline and other chemicals to subside so that you are at a place of logic and reason. Generally, this takes about 20 minutes. In some circumstances, however, you may need to sleep on things and look at them fresh the next morning. Am I judging the actions of my coworkers and communicating my judgment to others? The tendency to judge others is based on fear. Usually, we are frightened by seeing our negative qualities reflected in other people. Lose the judgment by realizing that the person is functioning to the best of their abilities with the tools they have from the parenting and environment they experienced. Do I become a blamer when faced with an emotional trigger? It is a common reaction to blame others or other things when feeling criticized, judged, or triggered into an emotional reaction. Stop the blame game by shifting the focus to your role in the situation and the things within your power to change. Focusing on another person and their negative behaviors only deflects energy away from where it is really needed. Work on yourself. Do I live in a fantasy world that management, my work culture, and the company I work for will be perfect? This fantasy can do incredible damage to a career. If this were possible, then the company would have to clone you to have enough employees with the same values, personality, and needs to be happy in the perfect environment. The reality is that workplace cultures are what you make of them. Work on the aspects of your job satisfaction that you have control over. Take on new projects that excite you. Ask for a promotion, a raise, a transfer. Do I spend a lot of time focusing how the company or my boss could treat me better and feeling battered? Being a victim is a sad waste of energy. Not only that, but your boss and your higher executives will have no time or energy to devote to a whiner. Take responsibility for your behaviors and look at changing how you present yourself. Do not give up your power of choice to your boss. Create your own improvement to increase your job satisfaction. Do I lose my temper and lash out or cry frequently? Excessive demonstration of anger or disappointment can create great disharmony in a team and lead to loss of respect and cooperation. It is critical for you to seek counseling to work through the root cause of your intense emotional outburst. Your coworkers will thank you. Can I separate criticism of my behavior from an attack on me personally? When your work is criticized, it is your work that is not up to par, not you. 
be careful not to make the differentiation so that you react with your head to the criticism and ask questions so that you discover the reasons behind the criticism and how you can correct the situation. Do I create political problems? If you have an intense temper, cry frequently, use passive aggressiveness to make your point, pout, sarcasm, sabotage, criticism, you will be using up your political currency. The more of this currency you use, the less likely you will receive that good evaluation, promotion, etc. Am I moody? Your moods affect those who you work with. If you are having a bad day, do whatever you can to not deflect that on those you work with. Inconsistency of mood creates uncertainty, communication breakdown, and low productivity if the team does not know how you will react to certain information and situations. Reactions to family and environment. A look back to your family of origin could reveal relationship issues with parents, authorities, or other key figures that have manifested themselves in your professional life. Once you identify why you are so triggered by, for example, blatant incompetence, you can then catch yourself responding with your gut stress instead of staying in your head and responding with intelligence and rationality to the work situation. It's important to maintain self-awareness on the job, Jane. Why is self-awareness so important, David? Well, maintaining self-awareness is an absolute must for anyone wanting to know how to be more productive at work, and it can help make you a better person overall. How do I maintain self-awareness on the job? You can start by just knowing what you're doing and how you're doing it throughout the day. Pay attention to your feelings and be aware of your emotional triggers. What is an emotional trigger? Sometimes something happens that causes intense feelings, often with physical symptoms. In many cases, it's important not to act on your immediate feelings, but give yourself some time to think clearly about the situation. What if I know I'm right and they're wrong? This is a good example of why it's so important to maintain self-awareness. Empathy, for one example, helps us see when we're wrong or make a mistake by allowing us to see others' perspectives and be sensitive to their concerns. I think you're onto something here. Sometimes I get so caught up on being right that I can't let it go. Knowing yourself is half the battle. When you can see your own faults, it becomes easier to accept others. Being open to the viewpoints of others and willing to admit your own mistakes goes a long way to making yourself more likable. So judging is something to avoid too? Yes, the tendency to judge is based on fear. Sometimes it's helpful to remember that a person is only doing the best they can with what they have. Avoid blaming others for bad situations and focus on what you can do in your role to improve the situation. But it always seems like there's something bad going on at work. The reality is that workplace cultures are what you make them. Focus on what gives you the most satisfaction on the job, things you have control over. Don't neglect new projects, opportunities for promotion or transfer, or a raise. My boss will never give me a promotion. He doesn't like me. What makes you think he doesn't like you? He constantly criticizes my work. Being a victim is not the way you want to see yourself. When your work is criticized, it is because your work is not up to par, not you personally. This may be an emotional trigger. Be aware of this and how you react. Make sure you understand constructive criticism. I get it, but sometimes I just want to cry or curse. Reacting with excessive emotion has a ripple effect in the workplace. It affects your coworkers, who may not even be at fault, as well as yourself. If you find you are unable to control your emotional reactions, it may help to seek professional counseling. This may be why you feel like you're being passed up for opportunities at work. Using up your political currency with excessive emotional outbursts tends to negatively affect your employer's perception of your performance. Building character in the workplace. What is character? One dictionary defines character in the sense we are considering here as the complex of mental and ethical trait marketing a person. 
In another dictionary, character is said to be the stable and distinctive qualities built into an individual's life which determine his or her response regardless of circumstance. Please click on the numbers below to learn more about building character in the workplace. Our character is who we are. Abraham Lincoln said, Reputation is the shadow, character is the tree. Our character is not just what we try to display for others to see. It is who we are even when no one is watching. Good character is doing the right thing because it is right to do what is right. Everyone has character. Character transcends race, religion, education, position, age, gender, and personality. People sometimes think of character as something a person either has or doesn't have. They say he has character, meaning he has good character. We recognize the truth that everyone has character and we distinguish between good and bad character. Our character determines our responses. The definitions discussed previously defined character as complex of mental and ethical traits and those traits or qualities are built into an individual's life. It is those qualities, those character traits that determine a person's response in any given situation. What are the character qualities or character traits that make up a person's character? How are they built into a person's life? Can they be changed? If you and I were to make a list of good character qualities or character traits, our list would probably include such words as honesty, integrity, dependability, loyalty, enthusiasm, etc. And of course, there are many more that could be added. Jimmy, I've been told it would help me to develop better character but I don't know where to start. Character is the set of complex mental and ethical traits marking a person. It's how you make decisions in any given situations regardless of the circumstances. There are traits built into your life that determine your response. So character is something I am? Character is something you do or have. It's doing what is right because it's right to do what's right. Well, what are traits? Think of words like honesty, dependability, loyalty, integrity, enthusiastic, and so forth. Why is this important again? Having good character affects your daily life. Some say it is the foundation for true success. Character determines success? Yes. Keep in mind the five foundations of character. First, trustworthiness, like being honest. Second, respect not devaluing differences and using appropriate language. Third, responsibility. Always do your best and think before you act. Fourth, fairness. Listen to others and don't blame carelessly. And fifth, caring. Express gratitude and help others even if you don't stand to benefit. Please click on the notes to learn more about character traits. Character determines success. We do not often think of character as having such a direct effect on our successes or failures, but when we consider the individual qualities that together make up a person's character, we can easily see that it is true. Character really does determine success. How does character affect our lives? It has been said that character is the foundation for all true success. A person may have money, position, or power, but unless he has good character, he or she is not considered to be truly successful. What are the character qualities or character traits that make up a person's character? How are they built into a person's life? Can they be changed? If you and I were to make a list of good character qualities or character traits, our list would probably include such words as honesty, integrity, dependability, loyalty, enthusiasm, etc. And of course, there are many more that could be added. Please click on the tabs provided for you on the left hand side to learn more about the five foundations for character. Trustworthiness. Be honest. Be reliable. Do what you say you will do. Have the courage to do the right thing. Build a good reputation. Be loyal. Respect. Treat others with respect. Respect differences. Be polite. Use appropriate language. Be considerate of the feelings of others. Deal peacefully with conflict and anger. Responsibility. Do what you are responsible for. Always do your best. Be self-disciplined. Think before you act. Consider the consequences of your actions. 
Be accountable for your choices. Fairness. Follow the rules. Be open-minded. Listen to others. Don't blame carelessly. Caring. Be considerate. Show that you care. Express gratitude. Help others. How to be an effective team player. 10 qualities of an effective team player. Demonstrate reliability. Communicate constructively. Listen actively. Function as an active participant. Show openly and willingly. Cooperate and pitch in to help. Exhibit flexibility. Work as a problem solver. Treat others in a respectful and supportive manner. Show commitment to the team. What is an effective team? A team is made up of a group of people working together to achieve a common goal. An effective team has certain characteristics that allow the team member to function more efficiently and productively. Click on the notes to learn more. Quality 1. Reliability. You get the job done and you do your fair share to work hard and meet your commitment. You follow through on assignments. You consistently carry out your work which is key. You can be counted on to deliver good performance all the time, not just some of the time. You promise only what you can deliver and deliver what you have committed to. Quality 2. Communicate constructively. Teams need people who speak up and express their thoughts and ideas clearly, directly, honestly, and with respect for others and for the work of the team. That is what it means to communicate constructively. Such a team member does not shy away from making a point, but makes it in the best way possible, in a positive, confident, and respectful manner. 3. Listen actively. Good listeners are essential for teams to function effectively. Teams need team players who can absorb, understand, and consider ideas and points of view from other people without debating and arguing every point. Most important, for effective communication and problem solving, team members need to discipline, to listen first, and speak second so that meaningful dialogue results. Ask for clarification if you are not sure what you are being asked to do. Quality 4. Function as an active participant. Good team players are active participants. They come prepared for team meetings and listen and speak up in discussions. They are fully engaged in the work of the team and do not sit passively on the sidelines. Team members who function as active participants take the initiative to help, make things happen, and they volunteer for the assignment. Their whole approach is can-do. What contribution can-slash-make to help the team achieve success? Quality 5. Shares openly and willingly. Good team members share. They are willing to share information, knowledge, and experience. They take initiative to keep other team members informed. Many of the communication within teams take place informally. Beyond discussion at organized meetings, team members need to feel comfortable talking with one another and passing along important news and information day to day. Good team players are active in this informal sharing. They keep other team members in the loop with information and expertise that help get the job done and prevent surprises. They share the credit when the team is successful. Effective teams. Effective teams have certain characteristics that allow the team members to function more effectively and productively. Click on the notes to learn more. Quality 6. Cooperates and pitches in to help. Cooperation is the act of working with others and acting together to accomplish a job. Effective team players work this way by second nature. Good team players, despite differences they may have with other team members concerning style and perspective, figure out ways to work together to solve problems and get the work done. Quality 7. Exhibits flexibility. Teams often deal with changing conditions and often create changes themselves. Good team members roll with the punches. They adapt to every changing situation. They don't complain or get stressed out because something new is being tried or some new direction is being set. A good team member can consider different points of views and compromise when needed. He or she doesn't hold rigidly to a point of view and argue it to death, especially when the team needs to move forward to make a decision or get something done. Strong team players are firm in their thoughts, yet open to what others have to offer. Flexibility at its best. Quality 8 Work is a problem solver. 
Teams, of course, deal with problems. Sometimes it appears that the whole reason why a team is created is to address problems. Good team players are willing to deal with all kinds of problems in a solution-oriented manner. They're problem solvers, not problem dwellers, problem blamers, or problem avoiders. They don't simply rehash a problem the way a problem dwellers do. They don't look for others to fault, as the blamers do. They don't put off dealing with issues the way avoiders do. Team players get problems out in the open for discussion and then collaborate with others to find solutions and form action plans. Don't expect problems to go away immediately. Give it some time. Avoid negative comments after the fact. Limit your remarks to those that can change things or avoid problems in the future. Team players get problems out in the open for discussion and then collaborate with others to find solutions and form action plans. Don't expect problems to go away immediately. Give it some time. Avoid negative comments after the fact. Limit your remarks to those that can change things or avoid problems in the future. Quality 9. Treat others in a respectful and supportive manner. Team players treat fellow team members with courtesy and consideration, not just some of the time, but consistently. They show understanding and the appropriate support of other team members to help get the job done. They don't place conditions on when they'll provide assistance, when they'll choose to listen, and when they'll share information. Good team players also have a sense of humor and know how to have fun, and all teams can use a bit of both but they don't have fun at someone else's expense. Quite simply, effective team players deal with other people in a professional manner. Quality 10. Show commitment to your team. Strong team players care about their work, the team, and the team's work. They don't need to be rah-rah cheerleader types. In fact, they may even be soft-spoken, but they aren't passive. They care about what the team is doing, and they contribute to its success without needing a push. Team players with commitment look beyond their own piece of the work and care about the team's overall work. In the end, their commitment is about winning, not in the sports sense of beating your opponent, but about seeing the team succeed and knowing they have contributed in to their success. Winning as a team is one of the great motivators of employee performance. Good team players have and show this motivation. Having good character makes for an effective team member, too. Remember, you're all working together to achieve the same goal. Sometimes I think I'm doing okay, but how do I know the team is doing well? There are eight characteristics associated with effective teams. Clear goals, effective leadership, relevant skills, mutual respect, negotiating skills, support network, unified commitment, and good communication. What are some things I can do to show I'm a good team player? You can demonstrate reliability, listen and communicate effectively, be flexible and willing to help solve problems, and treat others in a respectful and supportive manner. This shows commitment to the team. I get the general idea, but can you be a little more specific? For example, follow through on what you commit to do, and never commit to do what you can't. Effective communication isn't just speaking. Don't forget to listen. Be open to the suggestions of others and support them to accomplish the goal. Is there anything else? Focus on the goal. Winning as a team is a great motivator of teamwork. Employers seek out those candidates who best exhibit the qualities of an effective team member. Understanding Group Dynamics Introduction to Group Dynamics There can be great energy harnessed from the team members' different personality traits, if managed properly. Leaders must possess the skills to build their team around the right personalities and to manage those personalities. We all see the world from our own unique perspective, our own paradigm. When we are part of a team, we bring that paradigm to the team environment. Good and bad personality traits within a team can offset one another or build on each other. Rather than ask each team member to conform to a group norm, team members must recognize and utilize personality differences to ensure high performance. Different Personalities, Group Dynamics While there are many personalities that inhibit a team performance, there are others that help the team accomplish goals, tasks, and objectives. 
Some personalities contribute to a team's culture that facilitates high performance and accomplishments. Other personalities simply keep things in check and under control. Having this type of diversity and a team's makeup of personalities can play a vital role in the team's success. Types of constructive personalities. There are many personality types that are very constructive, which helps in becoming a high-performing team. A few of them are listed to your left. What is a silent contributor? Silent contributor. A person with this personality type is someone who gets the job done without saying much. They silently complete the tasks that are assigned to them and very rarely create conflict. One must take care to balance this type of team member with someone who is not afraid to speak up so that necessary communications happen for the team to progress. What is the devil's advocate? Devil's advocate. This type of person is someone who likes to challenge ideas and processes. They act as an internal check on what you are doing and the process you use. Although this person can generate conflict, oftentimes it is healthy conflict that brings ideas to light or helps to challenge biases. What is the facilitator? Facilitator. People who like to keep structured meetings, organize documents, and make sure things run smoothly are often referred to as facilitators. These people facilitate the operation of a team by making sure everything goes according to plan, on schedule, and in order. People with this type of personality help to reduce the probability that chaos will ensue from random team members trying to accomplish their distinct agendas simultaneously. This is a control member of the team. What is a leader? Leader. Some people are really good at leading a team to success. This type of person is not afraid to take charge, delegate assignments, enforce accountability, encourage others, and facilitate success. Some are natural born leaders, others simply learn by doing. What is a follower? A follower is a dutiful worker. Some people are really good at following directions and assignments and they work very hard to get their work done on time. This type of person more suited to this type of role because they know how to work hard and are okay with following instructions. Having the bulk of the work taken care of by the followers allows the other roles with the team to take care of their functions. Some can, some can't, some won't. The truth is that some people are good at team collaboration, some aren't, and others are unwilling. Some people just seem to have the gift of working with and leading a team and ensuring its success. These are hardworking people with a mind for collaboration and putting the success of the team above their own ego. This type of person will help others achieve their goal by working with them to resolve frustrations, remove impediments, and create an atmosphere of mutual satisfaction. This type of team player encourages the rest of the team to work collaboratively towards the team goal. Change within. Some people simply won't work with the team. This type of person thinks they can get the job done faster, easier, or better than the team could, and therefore simply will not cooperate. This type of person must get past their own ego if they are to work successfully in a team. And this type of change must start from within. Types of difficult personalities. To better understand the types of personalities that can be disruptive in the work environment, it is necessary to explain the types of personalities that inhibit teams in the workplace so that an approach can be applied to deal with each type. There are four basic categories of personalities that can be found in the workplace, aggressive, deceptive, passive, and destructive. Click on the buttons below to learn more. Aggressive. Aggressive people showing these personalities demonstrate hostile and forceful behavior towards others. People exhibiting aggressive behavior charge forward in an attacking and forceful way to display the frustration or anger they feel but cannot resolve. These people need to be heard and have a need to vent while at the same time needing people to listen to them. Aggressive personalities include perfectionists, dictators, hostile aggressives, attackers, egotists, bullies, and criticizers who always say no to any request. Types of difficult personalities. Deceptive. Deceptive people who engage in deceptive behavior aren't comfortable with direct confrontation and prefer to attack from a distance from behind some kind of protection. People with this type of personality are still vocal and tend to either complain quite a bit without direct attacks 
or compensate for their frustrations and dissatisfaction by being everything from sneaky to over-agreeable. These type of personalities include snipers who attack from a distance and always seem to have hidden agendas, overtly nice people who agree with everything until they are overwhelmed. Passive. Passive people who are meek in the workplace present problems as well. Passive personalities are negative, but portray themselves as victims, always ready to dismiss any solution presented to them. Passive personality types include martyrs, passive aggressives, moody people, crybabies, self-castigators, worriers, resistors, silent types, and those who say, it's not my job. Destructive. Destructive people who exhibit destructive behavior can be explosive and unpredictable. Failure to understand this personality type can lead to extreme problems in the workplace that can create an unsafe work environment. This type of inhibitor personality includes people who are sociopathic and those who are substance abusers. Aggressive personalities. The aggressive personality type is forceful in what they want and demand that their issues be dealt with right away. These aggressive inhibitors include perfectionists, dictators, hostile and aggressives, attackers, and finally, egotists. Click on the buttons below to learn more. Perfectionist. Every detail must be perfect or the perfectionist becomes negative. They are never satisfied with their own work and are their own worst critic. They have unrealistic standards and even work that is praised by other workers as the highest quality work is not acceptable to the perfectionist. They cannot accept any kind of criticism and will focus on anything not perfect, even if that part is a teeny part of the overall work done. A perfectionist manager tends to be a micromanager. Dictators. Dictators. A person with this personality will make a great deal of demands on everyone and will try to tell them how to do their job. They will walk all over the more passive personality types because they will let the dictator roll over them. Dictators are often angry and hostile and have a strong need to control. For the dictator, it is my way or the highway. Hostile and aggressives. People exhibiting this personality are pushy and demanding constantly argumentative and can be hostile and abusive. They have a need to stir things up and strive on chaos they cause. These employees don't care whether the reaction they get is positive or negative as they gain positive self-recognition regardless of the outcome. Attackers. These people demonstrate emotion-based hostility and aggressive that they are unable to control. These attacks are not personal to the person being attacked. The attacker is just looking for someone to vent the frustration and anger for which he or she can't find an outlet. Attackers are genuinely upset and need someone to listen to their pain. Egotists. These are attackers who have a superior attitude and think they know it all. They charge forward with their disapproval or anything that they as experts feel is not going the way it should. Egotists are arrogant and will disagree with most everything that is said because they like to be right. They always find problems, not opportunities. They often criticize others to make themselves feel better. Bullies. The bully uses threats and intimidation to undermine others. Bullies attempt to undo another person as part of their plan to retain popularity and power. Bullies have an inflated view of themselves and is threatened by someone who is likable, well-qualified, or attractive. They will humiliate, destroy, discredit, or intimidate another person to make themselves look better. Criticizers. A criticizer will strike down anything that is new, creative, or different. His or her mission is to disagree with anything that is said. She will jump on any mistake and disagree with it with negative feedback. A manager who is a criticizer exhibits it by always saying no to all requests. Deceptive Personalities. The person with the deceptive personality type will not directly confront, as in the case of the aggressive type. This personality will instead work behind the scenes or from a distance to disrupt the workplace or gain favor. These deceptive inhibitors include snipers, over-agreeables, brown-nosers, unresponsives, and rumor-mongers. Please click on the tabs above to learn more. What are snipers? Snipers. 
They use pointed jabs, humor, and verbal slang to put others down, usually from a distance and behind the scenes. These people take pot shots at others, use sarcasm as weapon, lurk on conference calls to silently gather information, talk behind other people's backs, and go to great lengths to make their behind the scenes efforts untraceable back to them. These people will not discuss their opinion in a public forum. What are over-agreeables? Over-agreeables. These are yes people who have a powerful desire to be like and appreciated. They never say no to anything and are far too uncomfortable to voice an opposing opinion. They are often overwhelmed with too many projects since they never say no to anything and are always positive in approach. These people can be problematic in the workplace when they agree with one person's approach and then also agree with an opposing position from someone else. What are brown nosers? Brown nosers, also known as bootlickers. People with this personality type believe that the shortest way to the top is on the coattail of the boss. They will exhibit a complete devotion and dedication to those in charge and will never ever tell the truth about their tactics or any of the boss's activities. They live in a constant self-reinforcing denial state that is perpetuated by the sense of importance bosses get from them. What are unresponsives? Unresponsives. These people are very hard to understand and to draw out because they don't provide enough to work with. They tend to be uncommitted to anything with work as the lowest priority in their lives. They waste time, spend a lot of time on personal matters, and try to get by doing as little as possible. Rumor mongers. This is one of the more difficult deceptive personalities and that much of their negativity is spread through ideas and statements that are not true, but are hard to trace back to the source. This person feels a great sense of importance when the rumors this person circulate force strong reactions from others. Passive personalities. These are people with meek personalities and are often self-deprecating to a fault. They tend to be moody and sensitive people who worry greatly, resist change, and complain, and need constant encouragement. This personality type includes the following. Martyrs, passive-aggressive, crybabies, self-castigators, worriers. Please click on the tabs above to learn more. What are martyrs? Martyrs. This person is the one who comes in early, stays late, seems to not have a life outside of work, and will do anything asked of them. While doing this, they will also complain about workload, other employees, clients, managers, and everything else in between. The martyr always feels like her efforts go unappreciated. They usually act defeated and powerless. The martyr's trademark statement is, I have given up everything for this company and nobody cares. What are passive aggressives? Passive aggressives. People with this personality type lack assertiveness and feel out of control. To remedy this, they find satisfaction in controlling another person's life. They are very jealous and resentful and have so little belief in themselves that they can't compete with other persons without bringing them down. Anyone that this person feels threatened by is subject to their anger, sabotage, deliberate procrastination, and other tricks. They often have good excuses for this type of behavior that clouds managers attempt to correct the issue. What are crybabies? Crybabies. People who behave like children when they don't get their way. They withdraw cry or go on a tirade. They then act as if they are powerless in the same way martyrs do and usually believe everything that happens to them is bad. What are self-castigators? Self-castigators. This personality shows itself in the form of constant self-put-downs. This person finds fault with everything he does, from work performance to salary to appearance to economic status to everything that defines a person's self-concept. Even if the person is performing well in the job, he will not see it that way himself. This person always takes the blame when something goes wrong, further enhancing negative feelings about personal self-worth. What are worriers? Worriers. These people walk on eggshells and are very sensitive to any negative comment. They usually complain about being too stressed and are expecting the ceiling to fall down on them at any moment. She is unhappy with the way things are and is constantly pessimistic both at work and outside of it. 
Passive personalities. These are people with meek personalities and are often self-deprecating to a fault. They tend to be moody and sensitive people who worry greatly, resisting change, complain, and need constant encouragement. This personality type includes the following. Resistors, silent types, not my jobbers. Please click on the tabs above to learn more. What are resistors? Resistors. Any kind of change upsets the resistor no matter how small. This person is only comfortable with the status quo and will resist any attempts to introduce new ideas and reorganizations. If the change is threatening enough, the resistor will try to sabotage it or spread negative rumors about the change. What are silent types? Silent types. These people keep to themselves and don't express any feelings or thoughts on any subject. They work completely alone and even when placed on a team will contribute nothing to the team in the form of active participation. What are not my jobbers? It's not my jobbers. These are very negative people who will reject any task that is outside of their perceived job responsibility, no matter how small the task may be. They usually do this as a retribution for a slight that someone in the organization has put upon them. Destructive personalities. These include people who have significant problems outside of work that impact themselves and others at work. They include sociopaths. These are people who lead double lives. Their work lives and their personal lives couldn't be more different. These are the people who portray themselves as supportive and charming, but in reality are cold and ruthless. They act on their impulses without regard for the consequences on others. Managers who do not detect that words do not match actions invite severely destructive consequences. Substance abusers. People with alcohol or drug abuse problems who try to mask their abuse at work. They will sometimes work at a very high level and then drop off dramatically. Absenteeism, followed by plausible excuses, are part of a repeating pattern that is destructive to the person and to coworkers. Those difficult people. Even if we have the best work attitude and are following every rule and suggested behavior in order to be successful at work, there is still one situation that is capable of undoing even the best of employees. It is dealing with difficult people. Sometimes difficult people can bring out behaviors we never knew existed in us. They can arouse emotions that cause us to behave irrationally and lose control. However, if you realize ahead of time just who these people are, you can avoid getting caught up in the trap. You can learn to deal with them professionally. There are many types of difficult people we must learn to contend with in our workplace. Too many to list, so for now, let's put them into a few main categories. They are as follows. Dominant bullies, impulsives, defenders, office romancers. Please click on the tabs provided for you on the left to learn more. What are dominant bullies? In many work settings, there is a struggle to get to the top of the organizational hierarchy. Some individuals take the struggle a little too far. They are pushy, they are backstabbing. They will stop at nothing to get to the top and heaven help anyone, including you, who got in their way. The best thing to do once you have identified this type of individual is to avoid getting caught up in the competition with them. Maybe you could offer them a bit of praise to throw them off guard. Try to communicate to them that you wish nothing but the best for them and are not a threat. Then let them go on their merry way. What are defenders of territories? In every company, there is a person who has marked off a territory that is off limits to everyone else, sometimes even the boss. It is a turf war. When they feel that they are threatened, they very often strike out to defend their turf. The best way to deal with this type of person is to respect their territory and to take it seriously. Never get into a confrontation over it. Find a way to gain access to the territory by polite means if possible. Be non-threatening. 
always acknowledge that the person has a right to the territory, and in that way, they should not perceive you as someone trying to take it from them. What are office romancers? There will always be office romances. It is a hard thing to control when members of the opposite sex work together. However, it is something that is not recommended. When the office romancer approaches, they will bring with them all of the charm they can muster. They will use compliments and flirtatious behaviors to try and woo you. The best way to handle this is to state at the outset that you are not interested and that you expect the flirtatious behavior to stop. Of course, you need to be tactful when doing this so as not to create any hard feelings. If the behavior continues after this, it becomes more of a matter of harassment, which should be dealt with quickly through proper channels. Do team members work the best when they have the most in common? Not necessarily. There are many personalities and other traits that complement each other in a team because we all see the world from our own perspectives and bring those experiences and perceptions together. What is constructive personality? Two examples are the silent contributor and the devil's advocate. The silent contributor gets things done without conflict, and the devil's advocate challenges the process to avoid and correct errors. I see myself more as a silent contributor, but sometimes I like to make sure everything goes according to plan. That would be considered a facilitator role, someone who keeps things organized, unscheduled, and in order. You seem like a bit of both. There's also the leader and follower. The leader typically takes charge and delegates assignments, and the follower simply follows directions and gets things done. I'd like to be in charge, but it doesn't seem to fit my personality best. It's good to aspire to something greater. Sometimes people think their approach is best and don't work well with others. They may even refuse to cooperate. This is because of their ego. And in order to work successfully with a team, the change begins within themselves. Natural-born leaders have a mind for collaboration and how to help everyone accomplish their part of the goal. This is possible to learn. If I become a leader, how do I learn about difficult personality types and how to work with them? I can list a few. There are four basic types of difficult personalities. Aggressive, deceptive, passive, and destructive. Can you give me some more specific examples? Sure. Aggressive people charge forward in an attacking and forceful way to display the anger they feel but cannot resolve. They're the ones who always say no to any request. These people need to be heard and have time to vent while having others listen to them. Keep going. Passive personalities are sometimes meek or outwardly self-critical, at times playing the role of the victim. Oftentimes, they are sensitive people who resist change, frequently complain, and need constant encouragement. They may feel threatened by competition and frequently withdraw to avoid confrontation, often remaining silent and working alone, even against instructions. Generally speaking, Passive people work best with plenty of clear instructions, sufficient encouragement, help adjusting to change, and positive reinforcement. What about the people who are nothing but trouble? Those are called the destructive types. They can be explosive and unpredictable. Failure to understand this personality type can lead to extreme problems in the workplace that can create an unsafe work environment. This includes people who have significant problems outside of work as well. One thing to watch for is that words must match actions or if there are certain patterns, such as excessive absences with questionable excuses. But what should I do when I have a problem working with the destructive type? In many cases, the best thing to do is to remain professional in your dealings with difficult people and not be afraid to speak with a supervisor about an issue that could compromise workplace safety. Don't let your frustrations get the best of you. I get the general idea, 
Is there anything else you think I should be aware of? There are many other types of difficult personalities, so here are a few quick pointers. The best thing to do with a bully is avoid getting caught up in a competition with them. Try offering a little praise and avoid antagonizing them. How do I deal with people who seem to fly by the seat of their pants? The best method for dealing with these types is to be gentle and offer encouragement. If they cut you off in a conversation, just do your best to emphasize the point without getting too loud. Any final thoughts? Always try to be non-threatening. Be respectful of boundaries in the workplace, official or otherwise, as some people may feel defensive about their responsibility or territory. Thanks again, Larry. Teams make much more sense to me now. We will now go over conflict resolution skills. Definition of conflict. A competitive or opposing action of incompatibilities. Antagonistic state or action. Mental struggles resulting from incompatible or opposing needs, drives, wishes, or external or internal demands. The opposition of persons or forces that give rise to the dramatic action in a drama or fiction. Fight, battle, war. Basically, a disagreement. The role of perceptions. Keep in mind that each party involved in the conflict may have a different perception of the situation, and part of this difference may be due to culture, race, ethnicity, gender differences, knowledge, general and situational, impressions of the messenger, previous experience. Solution. Ground rules. One person speaks at a time. We make a sincere commitment to listen to one another to try to understand the other person's point of view before responding. What we discuss together will be kept in confidence unless there is explicit agreement regarding who needs to know further information. We agree to talk directly with the person with whom there are concerns and not seek to involve others in gossip or alliance building. We agree to try our hardest and trust that others are doing the same within the group. We will support the expression of dissent in a harassment-free workplace. We agree to attack the issue, not the people with whom we disagree. In this next section, we will go over stages of conflict resolution. Latin conflict, conflict, escalation, stalemate, de-escalation, dispute settlement. Please click on the tabs provided for you on the left to learn more. Latent conflict. The first stage happens when individuals, groups, organizations have differences that bother one or the other, but those differences are not great enough to cause one side to act to change the situation. This stage is often referred to as an unstable peace. Conflict or Emerge Eruption after a conflict has gone on for some time without resolution, if the underlying frustrations are strong enough, a triggering event will start the eruption phase of the conflict. This event may be the first time people see the conflict. Stage 3. Conflict Escalation Escalation happens when there is an increase in the intensity of a conflict and the things people do to deal with it. It is driven by changes within each of the parties, new patterns of interactions between them, and the involvement of other people in the struggle. When conflicts escalate, more people tend to become involved. Parties begin to make bigger and stronger threats. Violence may start, or if violence has already occurred, it may become more severe. Stage 4. Stalemate. Once conflicts escalate, they often reach a stalemate, a situation in which neither side can win, but neither side wants to back down or accept loss either. Even though both parties may realize that the conflict is going nowhere, they will find it difficult to think about a resolution. Stage 5. De-escalation negotiation. De-escalation involves change within each of the parties involved in the conflict and may require the assistance of a third party. In most cases, de-escalation does not happen until the parties have reached a prolonged stalemate where both sides see that they are being harmed by continuing the conflict. Once they realize this, they are more likely to be willing to negotiate. Once started, de-escalation moves slowly and requires much effort. Many small steps must be taken before bigger steps can be taken and are usually coordinated by a third party. 
Stage 6. Dispute Settlement A peaceful solution can happen in a conflict when most or all of the underlying causes of the conflict are finally satisfied. The conflict may be resolved permanently. If some of the grievances are not addressed, the conflict may be settled for the time being, but may develop again later as the grievances again become significant. Conflict Resolution Skills Conflict is an aspect of life. If working through conflict is viewed as an opportunity for growth and change in a work environment, the potential for a positive outcome is great. On an individual level, the ability to solve problems or manage change plays an important role in your success. In the same way, the overall ability of an organization to solve problems through collaborative efforts has a strong impact on the organization's bottom line and overall success. When conflict is unresolved, it takes on a life of its own and eventually produces damages that could have been prevented. As you prepare to enter the work world, the skills of solving problems and resolving conflict prove very helpful. Five changes that happen as conflict escalates. Parties move from light tactics to heavy tactics, from efforts to please the other side to threats, power plays, and even violence. The conflict grows in size. The number of issues that people disagree about increases, and parties put more energy into the struggle. Issues move from specific to general, and the relationship between the parties falls apart. The number of people involved grows from one to many, as more and more people and groups are drawn into the conflict. The goal of the parties change from doing well to winning and finally to hurting the other. When you are having conflict with someone, consider using the following strategies. Plan an approach and describe the behavior. Look at the relationship. Determine the costs. State what you want and seek an agreement. Identify the problem. Click each note to learn more. Plan an approach and describe the behavior. Plan an approach. Once you identify that the person's behavior does affect you and others, you need to have a discussion with the person. Plan an approach that fits the nature of the problem, the personality of the person involved, and your relationship with that person. Describe the behavior. When you do meet with that person, describe the behavior in a non-accusatory manner and explain why it bothers you. Use I statements. For example, Today during the meeting, when I was talking about the budget and you interrupted me before I had finished my sentence, I felt really cut down. Look at the relationship. Look at the relationships. Examine how the person interacts with others. Is it similar to the way he or she interacts with you? What makes him or her act that way? Figure out the causes of someone's behavior. Helps point the way towards possible solutions. Determine the costs. Determine the cost. How does the behavior affect others? Does it cause people to lose morale? Does it affect productivity? Does it make everyone uncomfortable? If no one is affected by the person's behavior, the behavior should be ignored. State what you want and seek agreement. State what you want. Next, be clear about what you want. I hope the next time I talk that I won't get interrupted. Seek agreement. Be sure the person understands and try to get commitment to change. Do you see things the same way that I do? Identify the problem. Identify the problem. Identify the person you are having trouble with. Figure out the specific behavior or attitude that is bothering you and how frequently it occurs. Brian, I had a disagreement with a coworker today. We never get along. She drives me nuts. Well, Emily, conflict is basically just that, a disagreement. There are many reasons for conflict, and they usually boil down to differences in perception between two or more people due to culture, gender, knowledge, and previous experiences. How do I resolve conflict? Because I'm so over it. Good. Professional relationships should be your first priority. Keep problems with work separate from problems with people. Listen first, talk second, and explore your options together. Aren't there some ground rules to avoid conflict in the first place? Yes. The first ground rule to avoiding conflict is one person speaks at a time. You must make a sincere commitment to listen and understand the other person's point of view before you respond. You should also agree to keep what is said in resolving conflict with a person 
and confidence. Sometimes I get upset and have to tell my friends at work about it to feel better. Be careful with that. It's important to avoid involving others in gossip or forming alliances because this serves only to divide people. You're right. I have to work on that. What else? Just try your hardest and understand that your coworkers are trying to do the same. It's important to support courteous dissent in a harassment-free workplace. Finally, agree to attack the issues, not the people. Sometimes I don't realize I'm in conflict until it escalates to the point of name calling. How do I figure out when something is going wrong before it gets to that point? There are six stages of conflict and we often don't realize we're in conflict until one of the later stages. The first is latent conflict, which happens when there are differences, which one or more people are bothered by, which are not significant enough to change the situation. A good term for this stage is unstable peace. Then what happens? After a conflict has gone on for some time, if underlying frustrations are strong enough, a triggering event will start the eruption phase of the conflict. This may be the first time people notice they are in a conflict. Is that the stage I'm in? Actually, I think you're in stage three, conflict escalation. This stage occurs when there is an increase in intensity of a conflict. Threats, even violence, typically occur during this stage, and this is generally when others get involved. The result after this is a stalemate. Neither side wants to back down, and neither side wants to win. That doesn't sound very encouraging. Stage five is de-escalation, which involves changes within each of the disagreeing parties. This usually does not happen until both sides realize they are being harmed by continuing the conflict. After this, peacemaking can begin, in which the underlying causes of the conflict are resolved. How do I make sure it stays resolved? The four most important aspects of reconciling a conflict so that it stays resolved are truth, justice, forgiveness, and safety. Keeping this in mind will ensure a successful outcome. Why does it matter if we've only agreed to disagree? We don't like each other, but we do our jobs. What should I remember to help resolve conflicts? Working through conflict is viewed as an opportunity for growth and change in a work environment. Resolving conflict is a very valuable skill that employers like to see in employees. On the other hand, if you don't continue to work through conflict, five changes tend to occur. Parties move from light tactics to heavy tactics. The conflict grows in size. Issues move from specific to general. More people are drawn into the conflict. The goals of opposing parties change from doing well to winning to finally hurting the other side. Always keep these tips in mind. Figure out the specific behavior or attitude that is bothering you and when it occurs. Try to understand the behavior of the person you disagree with and the underlying causes. Determine how this behavior affects you and others. Then, plan an approach that fits the nature of the problem and personalities involved. When speaking to the person, describe the behavior in non-accusatory statements. State what you want and seek agreement by committing to change. Understanding Ethics Click on the buttons below to learn more about ethics in the workplace. 1. Set of Principles Ethics in the workplace are a set of principles consisting of right conduct, which involves the basic morale principles of honesty and integrity. That means no lying, cheating, or stealing. Some companies may have standards of acceptable behavior written out, but in other companies the employees follow along with what they see those above them doing. Either way, there is a basic right and wrong type of behavior that people accept at their core, even if they don't always practice what they believe. Stealing and lying are unacceptable. Stealing and lying are unacceptable ethics in the workplace, as they are any place else. Even though it may be common practice to take pencils, paper, coffee, creamer packets, and so on, this is technically stealing from the company. 
stealing from a company on a larger scale, like taking company tools or embezzling of funds, will ultimately lead to dismissal of an employee and prosecution as well. Workplace Policy It is important to remember that workplace ethics are shaped by two important factors. First, workplace policy must be in harmony with all laws and regulations that are currently in force in the jurisdiction where the business operates. This helps to ensure that basic workplace ethics preclude any pressures or coercions to engage in actions that are considered to be illegal, promote discrimination in the workplace, support unfamiliar hiring and firing practices, or allow wages to be set that are below the minimal legal standards for the area. Business Ethics Along with being shaped by laws and regulations, workplace ethics are also influenced by business ethics. For example, ethical business practices would include actions such as not using marketing tools or campaigns that mislead consumers. Workplace ethics would also involve establishing and operating support networks such as wellness programs that help employees to be healthy and happy. Ethics of this type would also involve the conscious effort to cultivate a working environment where people want to come to work and be productive because of the pride in what they do for a living. Workplace Ethics While businesses tend to comply with laws and regulations set by local jurisdictions, not every company sees the need to develop workplace ethics that affirm the worth of employees and motivate them to be productive on the job. When a company chooses to do no more than what is required by local law, the chances of heavy employee turnover are much higher. In addition, it is easier for cliques to develop among certain groups of employees, a state that can often undermine productivity and the cost the company a great deal in terms of time and revenue generation. There are a number of ethical issues inherent with workplace stress. Some of them include partial rules that apply to different departments, preference of opinion of some employees over others, unequal distribution of workload without a plausible cause. If ethical issues such as these and others are not sorted in time, they are potential stress triggers and stress ripples out, invading the whole community in some form or another. In the face of neglect, minor issues like varying reporting times and business protocols to be followed lead to serious physical and mental health-related problems. Pressure of work is fine, but when it is compounded with ethical issues that penetrate the psyche, it accumulates in poor employee performance. The honest is on both employee and employer to address the consequences of ethical issues and resolve them. Professional Ethics Ethical behavior is something that goes beyond simply obeying a set of rules and regulations. It is about committing yourself to do and act according to what is right, cognizant of your own conscience. To put it simply, professional ethics concerning one's behavior, conduct, and practice when carrying out professional work, it could be any profession such as consulting, research, or writing. Most professional bodies set a code of conduct that is to be followed by its members, such as doctors, accountants, lawyers, to name a few. It is assumed that the members accept the adherence to these codes of rules, including restrictions that apply. At the same time, no two codes of ethics are identical. They vary on the basis of cultural groups, profession, or discipline. Please click on the tabs provided for you on the left to learn more about the Ten Commandments within Ethics at the Workplace. The First Commandment, Thou shall not criticize thy boss. This is one workplace ethic that has remained sacrosanct over the ages. The boss is always right. Okay, he or she might be insufferable lout, but as long as you are working with them, they are always right. The most judicious employees will remain good in the books of the employer. However, with changing time, bosses are becoming more accessible to their employees. Some of them even love taking input from their workers and improve their businesses. But it is advisable to keep your mouth shut till ask. Another thing to avoid is malignant your boss and indulging in backspeak in the office cafeteria. The Second Commandment Thou shalt not rub thy colleagues the wrong way. Gone are the days when people were not even interested in what was going on in their next cubicle. Today, you cannot avoid befriending your colleagues at your workplace. Just be sure that you do not indulge in activities that create a bad impression of yourself on your colleagues. Folks at work can hamper your own perspective nowadays. Put in a genuine good word when they deserve it, and do not criticize them when they don't. That way, you will never go wrong. The Third Commandment Thou shalt not comment on thy colleagues' personal affairs. Respect your colleagues' private space, and they will respect yours. 
do not read their personal chats over their shoulder and do not be interested in their mail that is directed to the workplace. Even if a colleague breaks out about their family affairs or romantic shenanigans with you, try not to be overzealous in offering advice. Most probably, they do not want a nanny. They just want a set of ears to listen to their monkey shines. Fourth Commandment Thou shalt not compare thyself with thy colleagues. This breach of ethics in the workplace has happened ever since Cain and Abel started farming for their father Adam. In the machinery of your workplace, all employees are differently sized cogs in the wheel. Everyone has been assigned a post in the company because of some unique talent. That means you should not compare yourself with how others work. Don't ever begin cribbing with your employers when someone gets a promotion and you don't. It will certainly happen with you if you deserve it. The Fifth Commandment Thou shall not be a nosy parker. In today's workplace environment, one of the biggest worth ethics is to keep your nose stuck in your own affairs. Do not involve yourself in assignments meant for others and never show off that you can do a particular job better than them. Instead, try excelling in the work assigned to you. If you show off your superiority to others, your colleagues will think of you as too pompous and your boss might even reprimand you for not sticking with your own work. Please click on the tabs provided for you on the left to learn more about the Ten Commandments, Ethics at the Workplace, 6 through 10. The Sixth Commandment, Thy attire shall speak for itself. The work attire has changed drastically in recent times, and the Friday jeans have come into the work week. But that doesn't mean you will dress up like a pantaloon to work. Keep your attire matching your status, and do not break the dress code of work, however flimsy it might be. It helps when you are dealing with outside clients. Keeping at least semi-formal attire is the need of the day. The Seventh Commandment Thou shalt not bring thy family to thy workplace. It is ridiculous to speak about your family to your colleagues. Everyone has a family and they are most interested in what happens with their folks. But it is nothing short of moronic to discuss your family woes at the workplace. An unwritten rule of your workplace ethics is that you will never bring your family visits to your workplace unless they are invited. The Eighth Commandment Thou shalt invite thy colleagues to thy homestead. You must keep your family out of the workplace as much as possible, but it is good work ethics to invite your colleagues over to dinner sometime. You can bond there and even do some constructive planning together, but you must not jump in and invite everyone. Take your time, understand how friendly the people in your workplace are, and then subtly begin the invitations. It is, of course, understood that you should not have any vested interest in inviting your colleagues or superiors over. The Ninth Commandment Thou shalt take credit only where it is due, and shall not be modest about it. When there is an appraisal, make sure your work gets noticed. Inform the right people that it is your work in advance, so that when the time comes, you get the nod. Do not be crass about it, though. A subtle approach is required to make your presence felt in the workplace. At the same time, you should always acknowledge your subordinates' good work, especially if they are creative people working for you. Creative minds work better when fed on praise, and that works both ways. The Tenth Commandment, Thou shalt always keep thyself informed. The final rule of ethics in the workplace is to always be informed in what is going on in your business. It does not pay if you are the one always sitting mute below the corner in the front office or if you are the one dozing shamelessly when a business talk is going on. People will think funny about you if you suddenly pop up and ask them what's going on. If you are informed about your workplace affairs, it will also help you to behave better and put in a general good impression at the workplace. Professional Ethics or the Code of Ethics comprises of a range of issues including data privacy and protection of sensitive information, adherence to confidentiality agreements, no bias and analysis of data and professional consulting, resolution of conflicts of interest, accountability towards business. A Code of Ethics enables the business to establish the ideals and responsibilities of the profession or business. It serves as a reference on acceptable conduct, increases awareness, and maintains consistency and ensures improved quality. When professionals follow a set of code of conducts, it also enables their customers to trust the business with their critical information and is a concise effort to protect the interests of the client and professionals. Standards of Professional Conducts Standards, Professionalism Avoid Breach of Contract Protect Information Please click on the tabs provided above to learn more.
Standards of professional conduct. Members of any professional body are expected to understand and comply with all applicable rules, laws, and regulations of any government regulatory organization, licensing agency, or professional committee governing their official or professional activities. Professionalism. Professionals must exercise reasonable care and sound judgment to achieve and maintain independence and objectivity in their business-related activities. They must not intentionally conceal or misrepresent information or facts relating to recommendations, actions, and findings, or in revealing any kind of information to deceive their customers, clients, or partners, as the case may be. In short, professionalism is all about doing the right thing in the interest of the organization, profession, or business, as the case may be. Avoid breach of contract. Members, employees, or businesses must refrain from indulging in any kind of dishonesty, fraud, or deceit that adversely affects the business integrity, goodwill, or competence. They must act for the benefit of their clients or customers and place their clients' interests before their personal needs. Protect sensitive and critical information. It is assumed that professionals maintain confidentiality and do not disclose sensitive and critical information about their clients and customers to third parties except or unless you are required to disclose by, by law or if the information concerns illegal activities on the part of the client or if the client expressly permits disclosure of information. When it comes to their employment, employees must act for the benefit of their employer and not deprive their employers of the advantage of their skills, expertise, or cause harm to their employers or the organization. A code of conduct may be specif specified for all disciplines and adhered to. Finally, it is important to behave ethically on both personal and professional fronts with a clear conscience. My friend got fired today. What happened, Ashley? He was terminated for breach of ethics. What did he do? He got caught stealing petty cash from the office. Well, that's still technically stealing from the company and doesn't show good ethical standards. What do you mean, ethical standards? Ethics in the workplace are a set of principles consisting of good conduct, which involves the basic principle of honesty and integrity. In a nutshell, it means no lying, cheating, or stealing. They never mentioned anything about that when he was hired. Some companies don't have written ethical standards. Others do. Just because it's not expressly forbidden doesn't mean it's okay. It comes down to understanding where workplace ethics come from. Where do they come from? Primarily from two sources. Workplace policies or ethics must be in harmony with applicable law and local ordinances. In your example, you wouldn't steal coffee creamer from a grocery store, so you shouldn't take it from work either. Isn't obeying the law enough? Workplace ethics are also shaped by ethical business practices, which include not misleading consumers, taking care of employees, and contributing to a better work environment for everyone. In addition, workplace ethics affirm the worth of employees and motivate them to be more productive. In their absence, companies tend to experience higher turnover and loss of productivity. This is stressing me out. It's interesting you mention that. There are many ethical issues inherent with workplace stress. Like what? Rules that apply to some departments but not others, preference of opinion of some employees over others, and unequal distribution of workload without plausible reason. Anyway, it's important to maintain your own sense of professional ethics. What are professional ethics? Ethical behavior is something that goes beyond simply obeying a list of rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. It's about committing yourself to do and act according to what is right, cognizant of your own conscience. Professional standards can vary from job to job, but there are some general guidelines. Like what? Don't talk about people behind their back, especially the boss. Don't ignore your colleagues, but don't chat with them all day either. Casual conversation is good. Don't comment on your colleagues' personal affairs. Don't judge. Make sure you respect their privacy, too. Don't compare yourself with your coworkers. Don't involve yourself in assignments meant for others, and don't show off that you can do something better than your coworkers. Stick to your own work. Avoid discussing excessively personal or family issues at work. Don't take credit for something good you didn't do. And do take credit 
modestly when it is due. Also, avoid conflicts of interest. What are conflicts of interest? Conflicts of interest are situations in which your personal interests or activities could influence your judgment and decision making in a way that is not necessarily what is best for the company. Generally speaking, adhering to good professional ethics will prevent or resolve most conflicts of interest. It is your obligation to report any information that might influence your decision making process and avoiding concealing any relevant facts. I have a meeting next week about confidentiality and integrity in the office. What do you think that's about? Although standards vary from job to job, professionals are generally expected to maintain confidentiality and not to disclose sensitive or critical information about clients, consumers, or the company to third parties unless required by law. When it comes to employment, Employees must act for the benefit of an employer in a way that coincides with both professional and personal standards. Valuing and respecting differences. When the strengths of a diverse workforce are fully utilized, an organization can gain a more effective edge in today's competitive marketplace. Valuing and respecting differences makes for healthier work relationships that lead to better productivity. In the workplace, diversity refers to the differences we recognize in others and ourselves, such as gender type, culture, race, ethnicity, age, religion, sexual orientation, physical and mental abilities or challenges. Differences in the workplace. Diversity, respecting differences, attitudes about differences, experiences shape attitude, family association influences. Please click on the tabs provided for you on the right to learn more about differences in the workplace. Diversity. Diversity can also be used to describe differences relating to our workplace relationships, such as management versus non-management, main office slash headquarters versus field slash satellite offices, technical versus non-technical, employees with families versus single employees. Valuing and respecting differences. Valuing and respecting differences in the workplace begin with individual self-awareness. It is up to each of us to take a deep look into our feelings and beliefs so that we can understand how we can open our minds and change our behaviors to more effectively value the diversity around us. Our attitudes and differences. During this time, we will be asked to think about your belief system and how they were formed. Try to think about how your family or others Diversity. Diversity can also be used to describe differences relating to our workplace relationships, such as management versus non-management, main office slash headquarters versus field slash satellite offices, technical versus non-technical, employees with families versus single employees. Valuing and respecting differences. Valuing and respecting differences in the workplace begin with individual self-awareness. It is up to each of us to take a deep look into our feelings and beliefs so that we can understand how we can open our minds and change our behaviors to more effectively value the diversity around us. Our attitudes and differences. During this time, we will be asked to think about your belief system and how they were formed. Try to think about how your family or others have influenced your attitudes about other cultures. Some of your beliefs may be based on how you were raised or your own experiences. Experiences that shape attitude. Things that happened to you personally. Things that you personally observed. Things that you have heard from witnesses. Things that you have heard from somebody who heard it from somebody else. Third hand. Family association influences. Parents, grandparents, siblings, friends, school work associates, clubs, churches, environmental influences, movies, TV, video games, newspaper, magazines, books and studies, political campaigns. How is your workplace diversity meeting, Jim? Pretty good, Lisa. We covered a lot of topics. I never knew how important diversity in the workplace was. Why is it so important? Differences in a diverse workforce complement each other in a way that gives the company a competitive edge in the market. Respecting and valuing our differences makes for healthier working relationships, which leads to better productivity. Some of the differences include gender, culture, race, ethnicity, religion, age, 
sexual orientation, physical abilities or challenges, and mental abilities or challenges. I think I get it. Differences are things we are. So when lots of different people work together, they do better than they would if they were all the same. Close. Differences also include our roles in the workplace, such as technical versus non-technical, management versus non-management, headquarters versus satellite office, and employees with families versus single employees. How do people start to respect differences? Valuing and respecting differences in the workplace begins with individual self-awareness. It is up to each of us to take a deep look into our feelings and beliefs so that we can understand how we can open our minds and change our behaviors to more effectively value the diversity around us. Can you learn to value differences even if they used to bother you? Of course you can. It starts with your attitude towards differences. Try to think about how your family or others have influenced your attitudes about other cultures. Some beliefs can come from how you were raised, and some can come from your own experiences. Here are a few examples. Things that happened to you personally, things that you personally observed, things that you heard from witnesses, and things you heard from somebody who heard it from somebody, also known as a third party. Wow, I didn't realize all that could influence how I feel about simple differences in people. It's good to be aware of that. Keep in mind these tips for improving relationships in a diverse workplace. Utilize all aspects of effective means of communication. Be sensitive to others and listen more. Tips for improving relationships in a diverse workplace. Listen more. Think before you speak. Communicate. Please click on the folders provided for you on the right-hand side to learn more about improving relationships. Listen more. Listen more. When people feel that they are being heard, it increases their self-esteem and confidence. Listening encourages people to be less defensive and talk through concerns or problems. People are more likely to cooperate with the person who listens. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. Be sensitive to others. If you accidentally offend someone, apologize immediately. Avoid generalizations. Key skills. Avoid using words, images, and situations that suggest that all or most members of a particular group are the same. Communication. Communication utilizes all aspects of effective communication, including words, body language, eye contact. Practice conscious self-talk to change old assumptions about differences. Key skills are openness, active listening, and respectful language. Being assertive, not aggressive. There is a big difference between aggressive and assertive behavior. A lot of confusion exists with respect to these two terms, but there is quite a difference. Aggressive behavior is behavior that includes intent to do harm or cause unnecessary damage to another person. Assertive behavior involves making one's presence felt without the intent of causing harm. Fair play, self-control, and rules are observed in assertive efforts. Clearly to say someone is aggressive is not a compliment to that person's character. Aggressive behavior shows a lack of respect for rules and a lack of regard for the safety of others. Aggressive behavior should be displayed only in the defense of one's own or another's life, not in the workplace or as a means of solving conflict. Being assertive, not aggressive tips. Gesture, body posture, distance and physical contact, facial expressions, eye contact. Click each note to learn more. Gesture. Use hand gestures to add to what you are saying, but don't overdo it. Body posture. Body posture. Try to face the person. Stand or sit up tall and don't be stiff as a board. Distance and physical contact. Distance and physical contact. You should not be close enough to be in the person's face. Keep a comfortable distance. Facial expressions. Your face should match your emotion and what you are saying. Don't laugh when you are upset and don't frown when you are happy. A relaxed, pleasant face is best when you are happy. A serious face when you are upset. Eye contact. Eye contact. Avoid harsh stares. Do not stare at people 100% of the time. Being assertive, not aggressive. Voice tone, inflection, volume. 
When you are making an assertive message, you want to be heard. Pay attention to the tone of your voice, the inflection of your voice, and the volume of your voice. Use a volume that is appropriate for inside, face-to-face conversation. Fluency. It is important to get your words out in an efficient manner. If a person stammers or rambles on, the listener will become bored. Timing. When you are expressing negative feelings or making a request of someone, that is especially important. Seven days later may be too late. Doing it when you are most upset is not the right time either. Listening. An important part of assertiveness. Give the other person a chance to respond. Content. What a person says is one of the most important parts of the assertive message. Hey, Tom. My manager said I should try to be more assertive. What is he talking about? Well, Katie, being assertive is basically making one's presence felt without causing harm. Be careful not to be aggressive, which is behavior that includes the intent to cause harm or do damage. There's a big difference between the two, and a lot of people don't understand. How do you tell the difference? Well, there are three things you need to remember about assertive behavior. Fair play, self-control, and observing the rules. On the other hand, aggressive behavior shows a lack of respect for rules and a lack of concern for the safety of others. Sounds simple enough. Can you be aggressive by accident? It's possible that people can misinterpret your actions. The big key here is body language. More of that nonverbal communication? Precisely. How can I make sure I don't come across as overly aggressive? Sure. Here are several things to be mindful of. Avoid harsh stares. Face the person you're talking to. Maintain appropriate proximity. Use gestures when applicable, and pay attention to your facial expressions. I get the nonverbal part, but what about being assertive in verbal communication? Right. Pay attention to the tone and volume of your voice. It should be appropriate for this situation. Get your words out efficiently. Avoid rambling, or your listener will become bored. Pick the right time to make requests or discuss issues. Seven days after something has happened is usually too late. And don't forget to listen. Characteristics of positive work relationships. What makes work relationships work? Diversity, mindfulness, trust, interrelatedness, respect. Please click on the tabs provided above to learn more about characteristics of a positive work relationship. Diversity. Diversity can be defined as differences in the way people view the world. Whether it stems from differences in age, race, gender, education, or experience, some diversity of thought will occur in any work setting. Successful practice do not merely tolerate diversity of opinions but encourage it. Diversity broadens the number of potential solutions and enables people in the practice to learn from one another. Mindfulness In mindful relationships, people are open to new ideas. A mindful practice avoids operating on autopilot, encourages everyone to express their ideas without fear of ridicule, criticism, or punishment, and looks for ways to continually learn and improve. Trust. Trust is the foundation for any successful collaboration. People in trusting relationships seek input from one another and actually use it, and they allow one another to do their jobs without unnecessary oversight. Examples of trust include physicians allowing staff to use standing orders for services such as flu shots and practice managers making decisions based on input from staff. Individuals who trust one another can also openly discuss successes and failures to learn from them. Interrelatedness. This occurs when people are sensitive to the task at hand and understand how their work affects one another. In addition, they are continually aware of how each person contributes to the goal of the practice in the larger community. Practices that demonstrate this characteristic are better able to deal with unexpected events. Respect. Respectful interactions are considered honest and tactful. People who respect one another value each other's opinions and willingly change their mind in response to what others say. Respect is especially important in challenging situations as it can help individuals focus on problem solving. Characteristics of positive work relationships. What makes relationships work? Effective communication? Varied interaction. 
Please click on the tabs provided in the upper left-hand corner to learn more about characteristics of positive work relationships. Effective communication. Effective communication between individuals can be described as rich or lean. Rich channels such as face-to-face -face interaction or telephone conversations are preferred for messages with potentially unclear meanings or emotional content. Lean channels, such as emails or memos, are preferred for more routine messages. In successful practices, individuals understand that both rich and lean communication channels are necessary, and they know when to use each strategy. Varied interaction. Relationships in practice can be described as social or task-related. Social relationships are personal and often based on activities that exist outside of work. Task-related relationships are focused on professional issues. Practices should not be viewed social and task-related relationships as mutually exclusive. In successful practices, a mixture of social and task-related relationships is required and practice should encourage both. Adam, I don't seem to be getting along with most people at work. What should I do? Well, I can think of seven things that make work relationships work. Trust, diversity, mindfulness, interrelatedness, respect, varied interaction, and effective communication. But what does that mean? Well, Anita, trust is the first foundation for any successful collaboration. People have to trust that others will complete their assigned tasks without unnecessary oversight. People who trust each other can also openly discuss successes and failures, which generates better ideas. I do trust my coworkers. What else is there? In the context of diversity, it's not enough to tolerate it. You have to genuinely encourage and appreciate it. Mindfulness means you're open to new ideas. You must not operate on autopilot and should strive to express ideas without fear of ridicule, criticism, or punishment. Success occurs when people are sensitive to the task at hand and understand how their work affects one another. You need to respect each other's viewpoints. Thanks, Adam. You're quite welcome.